this is Splice. You're listening to a recorded session from Splice Beta 2022 in Chiang Mai. We've edited this, but only slightly. Hey, this is Richard from Splice. This session is Jakub Parusinski, the co-founder at the Kiev Independent, on how a team of journalists was fired, reunited, and then went on to build the most important media startup at the center of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And I kind of uh, didn't really know where to reach out because media management, especially in, U- in Eastern Europe back then, in 2013, nobody had any answers. I think now we have some answers. We don't have all of them, but we have some of them. So I didn't really know what to do. And uh, I decided that, okay, I need a management education. I actually came nearby to Singapore, reached out for managerial wisdom to anyone I could meet. That's, that's me in Bali asking the the local monkeys for some managerial insights everyone has a good story to tell don't let anyone believe other tell you otherwise after that ended up spending three years at mckinsey um, working on non-media stuff whatsoever which was a very interesting experience and yeah mckinsey is a complicated story we can get into that on the coffee break yeah decided to come back to media uh, this time with a focus on media management Launched a media consultancy, um, a media trade publication, some other startups that are mostly working in the media management space. And most recently became uh, one of the founders, investor, whatever you want to call it, technically playing the role of an acting CFO at the KF Independent. And that is the lovely team that you see over there. Of course, it's not the whole team. It's the people who are in the office that particular day. But the photo is nice. Um, <laughs> So, uh, as well as for the last 254 days, 255 days, um, working to support Ukrainian media overall. So what's the Kyiv Independent story? There was this publication called the Kyiv Post for about two, two and a half decades. It was the leading English language publication in Ukraine, quite uh, famous. I would say mid-sized media covering basically the world's window on Ukraine. And Ukraine is kind of a special country in the sense of it's in a Goldilocks zone for, for journalists. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's big enough that it matters. And there are regularly stories of international significance that pop up in Ukraine. I mean, let's leave the war aside for a moment. but. You know, revolution, scandals, uh, I mean, the Trump presidency had a ton of ties to, to Ukraine. Uh, Paul Manafort, before he became famous in the US, he was famous in Ukraine, we knew him very well. There were a lot of, I told you so, uh, emails sent by Ukrainian colleagues to American colleagues. It's also small enough that it's um, relatively accessible. You can get in touch with a minister, with top, uh, top officials, it's not like you know, Russia or, or the US or China where you basically can't get any scoops. So there's always a lot of good international journalists who are starting their careers in Ukraine. And there's actually a lot of people, if you go through the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Politico, a lot of senior people started off their careers in Ukraine, reporting from there, because it's, it's a place that just generates opportunities from a journalistic perspective. And a lot of those people started their careers actually at the Kiev Post. That was my case. Uh, I already told you about that. And the other thing to know is that Kiev Post was historically owned by various rich guys who basically, I would say, mostly owned it for prestige reasons. None of them that I saw made any real money on it. But one of them also destroyed his reputation on it. uh, And that's Adnan. He essentially, I'm not going to go into all of this details. This is a Syrian-Ukrainian real estate uh, investor from Odessa. Those are all kind of, those aren't sort of comfort words uh, all put together. He essentially bought up the Kiev Post after I had left from the previous owner, owned it for several years, and then decided that, you know, uh, it was too much of a pain in the ass. It kept producing stories that got him in trouble. And if you know, sort of like have done a bit of investigations into the real estate space. Real estate is particularly vulnerable to, re- to political pressure. If you're an IT company, you can pack up your bags and move to Chiang Mai tomorrow. It's gonna be a little bit difficult, but it's pretty 
all things said, is pretty easy. If you've got a million dollar or $500 million property somewhere, you, you're not moving that. And various regulations, delays, uh, administrative hurdles are going to be a huge pain for you. So basically, if you're a real estate investor, don't invest in, uh, don't invest in media that will get you in trouble with the authorities, right? I don't know which part of the audience that is addressed to, but if you're the one, please bear this in mind, right? Just stay out of it. Likewise, if you're, if you're in the business of sending rockets to the moon and electric cars, uh, be careful about media because maybe, you, maybe it's actually a bit more challenging to re-engineer people uh, than it is to re-engineer um, uh, cars. And so anyway, Adnan fires everybody, all the journalists leave. This is news all over the world partially because it's relevant, partially because all of these global papers have staffers from who are ex Kiev Post, right? You know, it's a, it's a sort of fast forward window into the pathway into all of these international media. Basically, a team of 30 journalists leaves. That is Brian Bonner, you know, editor in chief extraordinaire who sort of led the Kiev Post for, I think, something like a decade and a half, maybe almost uh, more, with one very sh short stint when he um, when when I sort of stepped in uh, for for a few months and Olga Rudenko is the deputy chief editor who is now the chief editor of the KF Independent launching a campaign so what happens when a media is taken over and a bunch of journalists leave well there are several scenarios but usually and and I know that some of you are familiar with this kind of situation because it's something that happens I think there's at least a couple cases a year in Eastern Europe, and I, I think around the world it's, it's much more. So what happens? Very often someone comes up with the idea, well, let's launch our own thing, and then what, right? And then it turns out that you know, the accountant, the IT team, whatever, the lawyer, they didn't leave together with you, and you have to do all of this stuff by yourself. Um, that's not generally ideal. But in, in this case, it turns out that there was a little bit of serendipity because there was an ex Kiev Post staffer who uh, had set up a company that specifically addresses media management issues. So setting up media, building business models, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, Genomics Media is the name of the firm. It's not for Jakub, it was journalism economics. That was the point, serendipity. Basically, over a couple of weeks, we decide to form a partnership. The editorial does what editorial does best, which means report on what is happening in the world, the important news, bringing it to audience. The management team sort of does all the managerial stuff of setting up a legal entity, uh, setting up a crowdfunding page, a membership page, hiring accountants, uh, staffing up marketing, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I guess the other thing, we needed to pick a name. There were a lot of very cool, very interesting, very creative names. I have to say, I was in team KF Independent from the very beginning. I think we spent like three weeks discussing this, which drove me absolutely insane. And the reason I was in team KF Independent doesn't actually speak that well of me. I, it was one of the first things that people named, it just came out uh, into the Slack channel that we had organized. And my point was, it's fine, just move forward with it, you know? Like, this name is okay, no one is gonna get in trouble with it. You know, just move the hell forward. And to be honest, this first period in November, so here's the thing, like, I'm running a company in November, there's this crisis that happens, I reach out to Olga, uh, together with my colleague, she's a partner in my firm, Darina, who's also ex KF Post, and we tell her, like, look, you know, you clearly need to launch something new, you're gonna struggle, by the way, Olga was doing, um, one of those programs in uh, the US where uh, she was in Chicago, which also didn't help things at all when you have somebody who's sort of 10 hours away, unable to kind of meet the, the team. Oh, that's why she wasn't in the photo. There you go. That's why she wasn't in the photo. She was in Chicago. Yeah, I'm jet lagged and also been, it's been a tough year. And, and basically we reached out to them and we told them, look, you're launching a new company and it's whatever, like November 15th. You have like three or four weeks maximum to put this together. Otherwise, everyone is going to forget about you, right? Like, it's going to be the December break. And then, you know, usually the first two weeks in a lot of East European countries are a period when you meet friends and drink a lot. And a lot of, by the way, actually political 
dirty dealings happen in that period because no one is paying attention. So there's always some really shady stuff happening. And by the time people get back into office, you know, 15, because there's also the calendar delay of two weeks, uh, or was, then, you know, everything that ha was happening in December, like, that's, that's over, right? Like, it's the new scandals, the new crises that people are living through. And so this was a very stressful period, right? Like, we were all really tired. We were pushing everything that needed to be done for tomorrow. We needed a website. We found an IT investor who actually was a seed investor in Cave Independent, which, by the way, having somebody who is in IT is great. If you were listening to Sasha's investment workshop, which I'm, I hope you were because it was fantastic, you should know that useful investors are really, really useful versus unuseful investors. I know that sounds really obvious, but a lot of time in media, I think we just see money and we think, let's go forward. No, we actually had an investor who had a team of developers and we told him, look, you know, we need a website. He's like, I can make you something beautiful in two months. And we're like, you have four days, right? Just, just get us something out, because we need to have something. We need to be in the news. Like the first couple of weeks, actually the first days, the first hours when you're launching this kind of project is so critical. I don't know if we have anyone here from Telex, but that's a fantastic case. When Index in Hungary was closed down, one of the first things that Telex did was set up a page with like press announcements in five different languages or six different languages, gathering names and emails of supporters, because people care for like eight hours. If you haven't gotten the contact with them, if you've missed that window of opportunity, then, I mean, that's half of, half of all of your opportunity gone. Okay, I'm stuck too much on this. Anyway, move fast. If you're doing this, move fast. In the first two weeks, we did exactly that. Launched the Save the Cave Post initiative, got lots of emails with people, and basically we were asking them, how can you help, right? And we got lawyers, and we had people who had working space. We had, you know, people who offered us food or whatever. Like, there was tons of different, there was a lot of goodwill, and we needed to sort of understand who offered what and triage that, make sure that, you know, we thank everybody, but we really pick the ones who are useful and, and move on, on right? Survey to get audience needs, you know, launched a newsletter, started the Patreon, started the GoFundMe. Like, all of that needs to happen immediately when you're dealing with this kind of crisis. And actually, amazingly, even before we had a website, we managed to secure like 20K in commercial contracts, which is kind of nice. But there's also, there's a premium, right? When people see that you're in the headlines, they get interested. But a lot who are able to move fast and have money also have a very short attention span. So you need to be able to grab that and utilize it uh, to the best of your abilities. So anyway, November through February were really busy and we were all looking forward to taking some time off. That didn't happen. Anyway, we had a team. Uh, as I mentioned already, there was the editorial team of the Cave Post, management from Genomics Media, my team that was on the management side. Very briefly, so wh what, is, what is this media consultancy? I mean, I promised my team that I'll, I'll do this plug. So there's a couple of advertisements that are gonna be part of this presentation. I'm sorry in advance. By the way, we're hiring, so you know. Um, <laughs> so basically, we've been working all across helping media uh, with uh, mostly business, technical, marketing, people challenges, organizational challenges, ran a couple of transformations. Did a little bit of work in Asia, and that's something that I would, you know, would really love to do more of. Do lots of, you know, basically we make PowerPoint presentations. That's what we do really well. I mean, I'm not saying these ones are, are that tremendous. We can definitely do better, but, but uh, that's kind of, you know, lots of nice PowerPoints with icons about strategy and business development and things like that. Worked with all, all a bunch of people. That meant that... We also had an opportunity to do that for the Cave Independent. Uh, in that period, so in those sort of four to five weeks that we had to actually launch a, a company, one of the first things was, you know, we wanted to build a media that was one, a business, that was super important for us because there's a lot of grant-funded media. There's a lot of great grant-funded media in Eastern Europe, but they, most of them struggle through because of a couple of things that are endemic to a purely grant-based model. So 
we did reach out to a lot of donors and we're super grateful for the ones who said like, okay, yes, we'll support you. But our idea from the very beginning is this has to be a business. Like this has to be a very successful business media. And for that, we're going to need also private investors. So we put together a 50 page deck and a nine page deck, a nine page deck for the ones who just wanted the, the top sort of like, here's the headlines, a 50 page deck to show that we had done all of the sort of analysis. These are just sort of examples that included slides like, you know, by the way, the formatting was perfect. There's just a Google Drive issue here. Like I would, I'm, I'm so ashamed of this. So, you know, we had done this audience survey, understood what were the needs of our audience, understood what we want to retain, what we want to manage, where we want to act. This is consultant speak for what you want to keep, what you want to do a little bit better and what you can throw out. We looked at uh, what is our target audience and we went quite granular. Actually, this is not even the most granular vision of it. It's the most granular one that you can read because the font size gets very small after that. But it was down to sort of like who are all of the sort of different groups, subgroups that we have in our audience, what channels do they use and what is the monetization potential of each of them right? Also very important. Like, what is the monetization potential that you're going to put on every single piece of your audience? Because they're going to be different. You know, one of the big challenges of running a media company, in my, my experience, is that you have to be quite versatile in sort of building a very matrix kind of approach in terms of monetizing different pieces of your audience that work under different um, circumstances. Of course, you need to have the big view, but you also need to prioritize. So we looked at what was easy to implement, what were the results. Again, a very sort of consultancy kind of approach. So what are you doing in the first three months? What are you doing in the next six months? What does your competitor analysis look like? Why are you in the top right corner? By the way, if you're making slides for investors, your media always has to be in the top right corner. That's $5,000 of free consulting advice right there. <laughs> Okay, so, and then, you know, how do we market, you know, this user engagement funnel, et cetera, et cetera. I think we had a pretty good plan. We had money, we had contracts coming in, we had a team, and then basically Putin declares war on Ukraine. So what does that mean for ordinary people, right? What does that mean for our team, for, for um, the people that you love, your families, your friends? It means that you hear that sound two times a day, five times a day, 15 times a day, and then you have to run to the nearest shelter. It can be a parking lot. It can be the basement of a hotel, of a cafe. By the way, one of the first things that all of the journalists who work in Kiev know these days is which cafes to go to because they have good bomb shelters downstairs where you still have access to Wi-Fi and things like that. If you're at home, it means that you have to have at least two walls. What does that mean? It's basically you don't want to be in any room that has a window directly. All the windows of everyone I know are taped over. Because if there's an explosion nearby, it bursts in, it cuts you up. If the drone, missile, whatever, artillery uh, hits your building, there's a much higher chance of survival if you have at least another room between you and the impact. That's a problem for journalists, but the bigger problem is that all the journalists have families. My wife is Ukrainian, my daughter uh, is Ukrainian, her family, uh, her brother, luckily one of them is in Prague, the other one is in Dnipro, he's with two, his two daughters and his wife are still in Dnipro, that's a hub in eastern Ukraine. We actually managed to evacuate a lot of people uh, before the war, both from our team and from our families, got lucky. At some point there was just this feeling, hey, no, it's too much. We need to move people and we need to move people with a specific idea in mind. So when it comes to family and friends, uh, or, or family members, especially the children, well, you want them to be outside just to be safe. When it comes to the media organization, it's a bit difficult. We're a young team. 
So the average age at Kiev Independent is like 25. I'm definitely the oldest guy there. Darina, who is the CEO, I shouldn't say this, is, but it's second. <laughs> uh, but she's, uh, she's uh, younger. And at the age of 25, uh, not to be a bit ageist, but I will be, it's very difficult to leave a war zone when your country is under attack. But here's the thing. If you're not a frontline reporter, you're a liability. You're somebody that we have to make sure that they have electricity, power, uh, uh, water, uh, heating. You will need food. You will need to, logistics. Unless you're a frontline reporter, you're a liability. So everyone who was support staff, management, social media, all of that kind of stuff, we really insisted, as many of them, to take a paid vacation in Poland uh, uh, just a couple of weeks before the war started. Turns out that was very lucky because unlike most of the, uh, our colleagues in the media sector, when we woke up very early on the morning of February 24, we didn't have to fear for our safety. We actually got to work. The other good thing about this, I guess, uh, the silver lining here is because you remember on the, w one of the first slides, a lot of us had experience from the revolution. Uh, we actually did some pretty decent planning back during the revolutionary times because we thought that Russia would invade back then. So we had plans. How do you evacuate? How do you relocate? What do you do with servers, documentation, people, and things like that? Obviously, a lot of it was out to date, but a lot of it actually helped us. So we had a plan going forward. So this is our chief editor, Olga Rudenko. She had come back from Chicago um, at the beginning of the year. This is her side that I stole, and I disagree with it a little bit because I don't think they were actually uh, doing so poorly. Um, I think they did extremely well. We did have to relocate a, a portion of the staff, the people who refused to move, uh, reorganized the team so that people could report. At some point, there was a big concern that Kiev would be encircled uh, and destroyed like Mariupol was destroyed, like Volnovakha, like Severodonetsk, and so many other cities. But they really did a great job. And I'm not going to go too much into the detail of who worked. I think all of that is in the open. That's part of working in the media. You work in a glass house. Um, I think they did a great job. The use of the emojis, this is the urgent news. Twitter, number one platform. Media is not a website these days. It is a newsletter, a podcast, whatever. For us, Twitter became the, the main platform. By the way, that's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit nervous these days, because there's some things going on there, uh, if you haven't heard. I think it's safe to say that KF Independent became the voice, the main sort of platform for international audiences to learn about what is happening in Ukraine. This led to tremendous growth all over the place. Now Twitter went to, from 30K to 1 million in 10 days to 2.1 million now, 2.2 actually, but the numbers are dropping because people are leaving Twitter. That's why we're staying up at night, one of the reasons. Patreon, the GoFundMe, hugely successful. Instagram, Telegram, these were all things that were launched by the team that was in Poland. So they basically had the Twitter feed and they would adapt it into all of the others. Uh, I mean, 60K, 50K uh, here and there is, is not that big compared to 2 million, but it's still good to diversify. And yeah, lots of glory for our editors, which is very good, they deserved it. Lots of Forbes 30 under 30. I mean, as I said, the team is quite young. Olga became the third Ukrainian on the cover of Time in history, and it's really inspiring to everyone, and we always make jokes about her now that she stays in the office late to just look at the Time <laughs> copy that is in the corner of the room. She hates when I make that joke. Uh, <laughs> lots of profiles, huge editorial success, I think. What can we actually um, learn from this? Uh, so. A couple of things, as I mentioned, like when you're launching a media, but actually, I mean, the, so, so to be honest, Cave Independent, now we're celebrating soon our, our first one year anniversary. It had two crises. The first one was the crisis when it was born. The second one was the war. And it stood up to the challenge on both occasions. And for me, this is a very big lesson because, you know, however much planning and fantastic PowerPoint slides you put together uh, to run a media, it really matters what you do, how you react to crisis. Because when a crisis happens, people's eyes turn to us. 
if we're doing nothing, if we're thinking about something, they will turn somewhere else. And those opportunities are extremely precious. It's, it's crazy to, like, you know, losing them is, is something that can be essentially a, uh, a, an extinction event for, for a media, right? You lose that opportunity, the next one will come in five years, right? I, you know, it's crazy to think about the, the, uh, such horrible events, but as a media, these are also the moment that you need to react fast, quickly, be visible, serve your audience. Your audience has very clear needs in terms of uh, communication, and I think that's one of the other things that was a tremendous achievement, really an incredible achievement, I, I would say mostly by Olga here, is that with a very young team, that is not just went through this crazy thing of launching their own media, which was very emotionally draining, but also has been attacked by the second army of the world, as it was. I don't think it no, any longer qualifies there, but it was the second army of the world. And that is seeing a genocidal war where you have clear, clear messaging from government officials, state media, absolutely like it could not be more transparent and all of the very calm and stolid researchers have no ambiguity on this it is a war that is meant to wipe out the nation amidst all of that they kept their cool and i think that was a very big achievement because the news was unemotional fact-based it was timely it was reliable and i think it did a lot to help people in a very difficult time what really matters as well is partnering with the right people. So, okay, I think they had a good management team. That's, you know, that's uh, my, my sort of claim to fame. But what I want to highlight here is actually our other, a bit more silent partner, not because we're ashamed, it's just we haven't had the time to properly announce it. That's the, <laughs> that's the truth of it. Uh, we have an IT investor uh, who has never invested in media as a tourist uh, in the official parlance of investors, but who actually knows the IT sector very well, has a good team of developers, and throughout the war, throughout the invasion, the bombing of Kiev, there was a team around the clock who was basically operating the website, and every time it went down, and it went down a lot, especially when you get, you know, 10 million in traffic uh, on your second month, yes, your website will go down. By the way, I mean, no comments here, right? <laughs> like, like, that's what happens, right? When you're, when you're in the center of the global focus, it, it happens. So having a, a team of people who are on staff to solve this is extremely valuable. Like, I don't actually at this point care about the money that they gave us. What was really valuable is that we had that team of people. We didn't have them internally. Having that kind of partner can be so much more valuable than, you know, a couple of extra 10,000 in, in a grant, even though that might seem like the priority at a given moment, right? In the longer term, having, you know, real value partners uh, is hugely beneficial. And finally, having a good and clear uh, story is, is, is also very useful, especially for media. It's, it's something where, and again, I think Olga has done a fantastic job in, in guiding this. It's, you know, at the end of the day, we live and die by our reputations in, uh, in media. We need to be very careful about managing them. It's not enough to have great values. It's not enough to have a great mission. Actually having too much of a sense of mission, and now this is the financial side speaking, might be a detriment because there is a lot of backslapping and congratulating and so forth. How wonderful are we? What you need is you need a very clear narrative and answers for your audience, for your community. Why should they be supporting you? What do you have to offer? Why is it meaningful? Why are they part of a bigger story? And for the 7,000, now 8,000 uh, community members that are supporting us on a monthly basis, that is the big thing. You know, we've done a lot of surveys and they answer lots of things, but part of the mission, part of supporting the mission of the Cave Independent is really what, what gets them there and that's sort of critical for us. The rule in um, our company at uh, Genomics is that we want to help the world, but first you need to take care of yourself. So the order of priority is you, your family, your team, your organization, the rest of the media sector. We actually had a very practical case of implementing that. The main partner in, in Genomics, his uh, second daughter was born on February 22. 
the nightmare that he went through, his wife trying to leave Ukraine, by the way, with Turkmen passports, that doesn't help, just in case you're wondering, that's com competing with North Korea for the worst passport in the world. Sometimes they win, sometimes Korea, North Korea wins. It's always a nail biter. Um, we're, we're always looking forward to those rankings to see how they will do this year. Just that was, that I can't imagine. Like all the embassies left, they relocated to the Turkmen embassy for a moment. She did. He went to pick up his wife again the very next day um, because the embassy was leaving Kiev and then spending 48 hours just trying to exit the city because of the level of traffic jams with a five-day-old wife who had just come out of labor, a five-year-old who's actually very helpful. She's an incredible, like at five, she's so mature, say more mature than many of our team members. <laughs> and I think he managed to pick up like seven sort of refugees from different media organizations along the way. That, that was really a horrendous journey. He was taking care of himself at KF Independent, at Genomics, we also prioritize in that way because if you're, not, if you're not okay, you can't help others. We were lucky. We actually had a large part of the team that was abroad. We managed to secure the financial side of the KF Independent in the first few hours, actually, of the, of the war. The first few days, we knew that we would be okay until the end of the year. And so we started together with The Fix, that's one of the other startups that I launched, Genomics, KF Independent, Media Development Foundation, and Are We Europe, that's a friendly uh, NGO in, uh, in, in Belgium, launched a campaign to support Ukrainian media overall, using the KF Independent as a platform. So since it had this million Twitter followers and then two million, uh, we really used that to say like, hey, we need help now. It worked really well. We raised like a million pounds on GoFundMe. Uh, we raised three and a half million uh, euros overall. I mean, nowadays it's no difference, euros, dollars, pounds, but back then it still had a little bit of difference. Uh, and mostly these were very fast donations. And what I want to highlight here, so first of all, huge thank you to all the organizations who are here, and if you know, you're part of them, like, thank you. The thing that was really amazing and that was incredibly useful was actually the publishers. And this is the point that I wanted to make. Our goal with this campaign was to move fast to help all of the media that might have urgent needs on the ground immediately. And so the goal was, was really immediate support, and that means you need to deliver support in the next four hours. We don't care how, right? Like those are immediate needs. If it, you can't deliver it immediately, can you deliver it in the first, you know, next three days? Remember, on February 24, all the world's experts are telling us Kyiv will fall in three days. And we're like, okay, so what can we do in three days, right? Like, what can we get into Kyiv that will be helpful in some way to the journalists who will be locked and potentially lost there that can be of some value? Right? Like, how do we utilize these 72 hours? We set up a gold fund me, and you know what happened? It was immediately banned and closed. Because, of course, if there is a natural disaster or a war or something like that, there's a million people who set up GoFundMe's. And, uh, of course, GoFundMe is kind of closing that down. They should. Otherwise, there would be scams like hell. This is also something that you discover. You discover a lot of things during war. What kind of bulletproof vest type is okay, which kind is not, what kind of rocket makes which sound, it's crazy. But you also discover how some organizations work. And GoFundMe just locks all of that stuff for two weeks. There's a war, two weeks locked. Thanks goodness we had one that was operating. We had a Twitter account that was incredibly loud and we immediately wrote to GoFundMe saying like, hey guys, how about you don't block the website when it's like, you know, and this was 11 o'clock on the morning of February 24th, right? Uh, the team in San Francisco, actually very senior team, got back in touch with us within two hours. We unlocked it, we moved it forward. Thanks God, that was amazing. But even that funding wouldn't arrive quick enough. And why I'm telling you all of this? There's a ton of amazing philanthropic organizations that are supporting media in these kind of situations. They don't move that fa as fast as GoFundMe. And GoFundMe wasn't fast enough because the time that the money comes through the GoFundMe system onto your account, that you take that money from your account and you send it to the media, this is at least 10 days. Maybe seven if you're lucky. Cave is falling in four hours. What do we do? 
took all the money that we had on all the company accounts, uh, different ones. We were relatively confident that we'll have money coming in in the future. Opened up crypto donations. Crypto moved fast. By the way, I, I think there's a lot of applications there that, you know, I know it's not so trendy now, but uh, it was very useful. In the first four hours, 50K in crypto sent out to different media all over Ukraine that was turned immediately into Ukrainian krivnya, used to purchase gas, food supplies, whatever equipment they needed. I think 60 media supported on the first day, thanks to this, this approach. And the whole point was to move fast, because the international donors, they were gearing up, and they're the sort of the big mastodons, the titans, the tanks, that can actually roll in here. We were the light infantry, we needed to move the fastest. Despite all of this, sorry, I'm going a little bit all over the place, the big challenge that, uh, that we ran into was on the logistics side. Uh, if you're ever in charge of logistics, please don't uh, hire someone professional. It's very difficult. We had uh, six different work streams of emergency support, tech support, relocation of people, fund disbursement, etc. Logistics was 70% of the effort. 70% of the effort across six different work streams. We managed to move in the end, I think, three and a half tons of bulletproof vests amongst the first to make them to Ukraine after the start of the war, but this was a nightmare. Um, the thing is, you think that logistics works like this? It actually looks like this. You have a million steps. There's always somebody that has like a specific procedure. They need to prove this from customs. You need to do this, you need to do that. Complete nightmare. Anyway, the main point I wanted to make in all of this, the stuff that I didn't think about, but which turned out to be incredibly helpful, was the other publishers. Because here's what happened. On the second day of the war, if I recall correctly, Sifted reached out to us and said, what can we do to help? I was like, I don't know, cash. It's like, okay, all of the money that we're getting, or like half the money that we're getting on this week's like subscription, we're sending over to you. Fantastic. The local reached out to us. Incredibly helpful. By the way, fantastic people. If you ever have a chance like, to, to meet that team, they're amazing. Reached out to us, what do we need? Well, we're converting cash into crypto, sending it as fast as possible, turning it into Ukrainian hryvnia, distributing it to media. We have 20K. Send us 20K. It was a 15-minute discussion. No donor can move like that. And not because they don't have the right intentions. They don't have the administrative capacity to do that. Publishers, private entities, for-profit entities, can have those, that kind of uh, reaction. What was amazing is that this then led to a cascade of different partners, step, uh, the publishers stepping in. Uh, the big one was Axel Springer with half a million uh, that we turned into bulletproof vests, level four, with on both sides the plates, very specific. I think I can still remember the measurements because you need to get them through specific routes and things like that. This was such, a, such an aid. And I think I want to stop on, the, on, on this point. Look, crises happen, wars happen, disasters happen. Media, we're, we're pretty weak as an industry, let's be honest. We, we're not rolling in cash. We don't have the resources that a lot of other industries have. But there's also a lot of... A lot of but that doesn't mean we don't have anything. And I think the solidarity and the support between publishers uh, specifically um, is really something amazing and if you have the opportunity to help others um, really do so like I think we just come out so much stronger and to those who did help us I'm incredibly grateful and that's it You've been listening to a session recording from Splice Beta 2022. Let us know what you think. You'll find us on splicemedia.com. This is a Splice podcast, and it's produced by Norman Chella at Podchaser. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Google, International Fund for Public Interest Media, International Media Support, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, Luminate, Media Development Investment Fund, Meta, and Telem Media. This is Splice.